flow. Because we don't have any electrons going on, we don't have any T's plus, T's plus, plus, nothing to be voting on, nothing to be controversial. Um, school is letting out. The students have just graduated. Um, public schools will soon take a vacation, and so we're in the little school time. But we're here, and so welcome. Uh, if you would join me in uh, rising and observing a moment of silence, we have great men and women around the world who serve our country. And if you would take a moment and remember them with me. And the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So when you came in, you should have received three slips of paper an agenda of this meeting, minutes from the last meeting, and a membership form. Well, maybe you received four slips of paper. There's something about an Denise Ray. Uh, Walls Watershed Fundraiser, which is on Saturday, so of course it's a paper. Um, the minutes from last month review our meeting with Jim Galloway. And if you see any corrections, I would entertain them. In fact, I have a correction. Uh, when Jim gave me the financial report this time, he says the beginning balance, which was our ending balance last time, I said incorrectly, it's 700 and $90.80, not $946.69, due to the mis-subtraction of a uh, check. <coughs> Are there any other corrections? I took the Master Garden class, 
and I, it's given out at the county extension. And I sort of knew about the county extension, but I didn't really know what they did. The county extension is a really great collaboration between the University of Georgia and our county government. So it's a place where at least two pots of money come together and are used to support farmers, students, homeowners, um, really a wide range of people. So I thought that it would be great to have our county agent, uh, Jake Price, talk to us about all the things that the county extension does because people just expect the extension to be there um, and we need to appreciate how that we pay for it. So my friend Jake Price.
based off the research they've done in the experiment station. So they don't recommend it unless they research it. So you may hear things come out of maybe so-called cutting edge, you know, how can y'all know anything about this? A lot of times it's uh, it's not research, we don't have any recommendations on it. And sometimes they may not have research on it because there may not be uh, enough people available to do a lot of research. And uh, that's that's one of the problems I, I have with people call me and have questions about olives. Anybody heard of olives being grown in the area? Mm -hmm. Yes. But uh, sometimes people call me and ask me for information on olives. I don't have any information on olives. And that's because um, nobody has done research on olives in Georgia. And uh, we've been without our um, fruit specialist probably for four years. And um, olives is kind of like an area that's kind of like a gray area. Nobody knows who to assign it to um, as far as being a specialist. And, um, most of the information on olives are just kind of coming up with uh, over there in Lanier County and they're using people who grow olives in California and other places all over the world. And you know, their information in California may not pertain to here, so to speak. <coughs> information in Italy may not transfer to Georgia. So that's still kind of an experiment there and uh, hopefully um, that's going to turn out okay and be a good industry for Georgia. But I um, mean, you know, there's a lot of information for the extension service. Um, one of the hot topics slightly that you know about this is uh, arsenic in the water. Anybody heard of any arsenic in the water here? There was something in the paper a couple, maybe a month ago now, about uh, arsenic in drinking water. And uh, we can test for that. We have access to the uh, soil and water lab in Athens, as part of the University System of Georgia. And uh, we can send in water samples, they can test for arsenic, they can test for bacteria, they can test for minerals, pH, they can test for pesticides, a uh, big extensive list of what all they can test for. And probably the most common thing we do is soil tests. So we do a lot of soil testing. We can bring a soil sample to our office and we can uh, send it to the University of Georgia. And you'll get results, say you want to grow a garden, it'll give you a result maybe in 10 days. And they'll send it to your email and it costs six dollars. That's, uh, that's really a great deal to tell you what you need to grow your plants. And it's pretty specific. It'll say, or it'll group your vegetables into three groups. Heavy feeders, light feeders, and kind of medium feeders. So it'll have like a list of your heavy feeders. And say for heavy feeders, use this. And uh, say 10, 10, 10, and it'll say use it. Put it pre-plant before you plant. And again, um, a month later. So it's pretty specific. And it's specific for every crop. So if you wanted to grow zeddies, and zeddies weren't doing well, you could do a soil test there. And uh, it may say your pH is too high. And it'll tell you how to adjust your pH and get your zeddies um, growing well. But uh, basically, it can save you a lot of money and it can save a lot of home experimentation. So you can do this and this for years trying to get the garden doing well, or you can take it to the next service and figure out what your problem is and uh, fix it right then and there. That'll save you some money. Uh, say you can put an unnecessary uh, fertilizer in your uh, garden too. But uh, those are real popular things at the office. I've got, um, today I had, as Andy said, it must have been a full moon this weekend. I don't know. But uh, we had all kinds of different questions. I had somebody call me wanting to know how to uh, get into the turkey production operation. So yeah, that one kind of came out of that field. And then we had one just somebody wanted to get to the blueberry business. Um, then I had some, some issues with some corn. I found a disease in corn. I went to the past this week and it's called the northern corn blight. And it's a new disease that's come around over the last uh, year or two. It's really not uncommon here, but it's not uncommon for new diseases to be introduced to Georgia, whether it be the hurricanes or, or whatever means. And, uh, Farmers are faced with different situations. You would think from year to year, if you grow corn, it's going to be the same every year. But uh, it's remarkable to me how different every growing season is. It's just unbelievable. You can grow peppers year after year. This year you may have problems with white flies. This year maybe something called broad mite. So different pests will emerge every year. And uh, it's just always a mystery to try to find out what's what's going on out there. But this one, uh, you can kind of tell. I was just looking for a few of the lesions from brown necrotic spots. That's how it starts out. But uh, if you let this go and a lot of corn conditions are just right for the disease, um, you can have a tremendous loss in the yield. And uh, last year, um, 
some varieties were a lot more susceptible to this disease than others. And uh, pass that around. But uh, if you get on the fungicide program, it can help prevent this disease. And uh, that's some of the research that the extension um, does. They'll say, all right, if you put your fungicide out right before the corn tassels, um, that's a good time to put it out. If you try to, try to spray it as least as possible and get the most bang for your buck when you do spray it. Uh, we try to help farmers uh, make decision, decisions in agriculture just to help them be profitable and uh, produce uh, as much food as they can. So uh, you know, that's one way in extension to make a big impact. So the farmer has a thousand acres of that. If he can use this fungicide instead of this fungicide, this one costs half the price of this one, he can save tens of thousands of dollars from this one. That's a great question. Sir? I'm on with that there. It could, depends on weather conditions uh, and variety. Some varieties of corn last year were a lot more susceptible. I had a farmer that, uh, he had two different varieties of corn in his field. And on one half, he had one variety that was not very susceptible. But then he had, uh, a lot of times the farmer would go around the field. Plant. He planted that variety that was not susceptible around the field. On the interior, once you walked in there about 20 feet, you got to the rows, it went from green to brown. Wow, you know, if you were looking at it from overhead, you would have seen it, but this from the, from the road is walking around every day, you don't see it when you get in there. And uh, part of the problem with that disease is it will plant and torque it over to make that ear of corn. It's going to take nutrients from other parts of the plant. And uh, if the leaves aren't producing because they've got so much of this uh, dead tissue on there, it's going to draw nutrients and carbohydrates from uh, the stalk. And that stalk will get weak. And in field corn, that stalk has to sit there and dry. And if you get a good wind, all that stuff's going to blow over, you have to get stalk. So you don't want that to go too far. And if you wait too long to hit it, it's, it's too late. So a lot of times, disease management is more prevention. Um, knowing that you're going to have this, you need to put out a fungicide application, especially in vegetables. Things happen very quickly in vegetables, and it's a very high value crop. Peppers that may cost you uh, $10,000, $15,000 an acre to produce peppers. Um, you've got to sell plastic, you've got fumigation under there, kill all the uh, nematodes and weed pests. Then you've got drip irrigation going under there, um, and then you've got uh, your well, you've got fertilizers, and uh, all kinds of things that just add up and make them very expensive. The ironic thing about farming, the cheapest thing about farming is actually the plant. So you can, you can have a plant, that's the cheapest thing, but everything else you've got to have around this plant to make it produce is what costs a bunch of technology and things like that. Um, cotton, corn, it's, it's, there's so many varieties. A lot of people see cotton growing in the field and things that just, just grow cotton. But, uh, how many varieties of cotton do you think are, are out there? Hundreds, hundreds, and some varieties that do well, and they do well in certain situations, like this variety may do great under irrigation, whereas if you put this variety under irrigation, you may get 300 pounds less per acre of cotton, and that can make a huge difference. But this other one that doesn't yield as much under irrigation, if it's a dry land environment, this one still may be consistently giving you a yield of 1,000 pounds, but the one that requires irrigation, it may give you 500 pounds, so this variety may be better in non irrigated areas than this variety here. So, you know, we always do tests on things like that. And it depends on the soil. If you got sandy soil, like we have a lot of sandy soil here, this variety might be better than this variety. They do variety trials all over um, the cotton growing area, and um, we've done those here for the past several years. And um, when you put all of that information together, you know, a lot of times two or three varieties will come out as being, this one's real good, this one's the best in real wet environments or a lot of rain, this one's pretty good with drought too. So farmers try to pick the uh, varieties that uh, suit their needs. So uh, depending on what kind of farming you're trying to do, you're trying to get 1,500 pounds per acre compared to 800, um, that's how you choose the variety. Corn is not so much variable as the uh, but uh, I could talk about a ton of different topics, but uh, I got some publications on arsenic here.
If anybody wants some of these, I got some things that you can have. There's some books through extension that you can buy. Um, agriculture is not the only thing we do. We uh, have the 4-H program that runs through our office. Anybody ever heard of the 4-H program? Mm -hmm. yeah. 4-H, uh, everybody's familiar with 4-H because it involves uh, uh, kids, children. So we have a 4-H agent that's uh, fairly new here. She started in January. And uh, we have two full-time 4-H program assistants. And they actually go into the schools in the fifth grade and they reach the kids in the fifth grade. And they introduce them to 4-H. It's kind of like uh, applied learning and gives kids a chance to do things outside of the school environment. They can do demonstration projects, say if they're interested in video games in the fifth or sixth grade, and say, hey, come up here and do a speaking project on how you play the video game. And they get yeah, up in front of people and teach them how to put a little project together, and they can uh, you know, build confidence speaking in front of a crowd. And then we'll take them to a competition called District Project Achievement. And uh, this year, I think we took 60 kids to uh, Moultrie, and they competed with fifth and sixth graders from Cockwood County and a lot of kids in this whole district, so they just get together with a bunch of other things. So they get to get out of Lowndes County and see a lot of other things. And as they get older, they go to Rock Eagle, they have opportunities to go all over the country, really doing things that they're So 